Great. Just making sure, can you hear me well? I can shout as well, so I'm, I'm sure it's for the recording. I guess everything is good. Um, welcome. After the coffee break, you're all here to start exploring data. Um, so this, this is an interactive session, right? So what we intend to do is for um, the first 20, 25 minutes, we will try to give you a very super quick speed dating of all the tools we have developed and what you can later on use, everything is available. And then for the other half of the session, what we intend to do is give you some exercise to do, right? So we have ends out that we will uh, distribute to you with step-by-step -step, uh, recipes to follow that we will also do on screens. But ideally, you will use your own device to do the same thing and hopefully get autonomous in using our tools. That's why this is really an ends on session. So for the second part, you will need a device, ideally a laptop, but for some of you, uh, a mobile device, for some of the tools, a mobile device will also be enough. So you're prepared? Yep. Um, right. You get that in 10 seconds. It's the same password for everybody. So it's funny all the room is sitting here. <laughs> But OK, so let me start uh, for this. And do not hesitate to interrupt me whenever you have uh, questions. So you understood from uh, the beginning of the, of the morning already, we, we tell you that we have those centuries of collective smell memories that constitute our heritage. And uh, ideally, when we started this project, we wanted to be able to answer this sort of questions, like what are the most frequent smell sources in a particular city in a particular time period? Or when did the smell of pollution start to be mentioned? Here we're talking about textual documents across languages in Europe. Or what smells were perceived during a particular event, such as a military battle, and so on and so on. So our tools uh, aim to, to give you the ability to answer those questions. So, this, those, those smell memories uh, in Odoropa have been um, captured, extracted from two modalities, the textual modalities, and here we're talking about uh, hundreds of thousands of texts which were already digitalized, digitized that we could have access to via national libraries in Europe, uh, and also, of course, um, pictures and pictorial artworks, uh, so images that we have collected and analyzed. And, and the tools you will see enables to um, really run analysis on those two modalities. Um, and not only you will be able to input you with your own text to do, uh, to do those analyses, but we also have uh, um, collected large corpora of documents that we have pre-analyzed and that, that you can explore now. And that constitutes what we call the European olfactory knowledge graph. And you will see that the demonstrator we have enables to, to browse and search through um, those corpora. So let's start with the first tool, the image processing demonstrators. And I'm calling here Matthias to do the first part. Thanks. So yeah, images, uh, smells and images. Just like maybe what we talked about before, vocabulary is something that's even worse here in a way, right? We don't have directly smells and images. So we thought about how can we actually access smells and images, and uh, yeah, we have to rely on indirect references, or cues, or metaphors. And what we came up with is some kind of a taxonomy of how uh, smells... Uh, am I loud enough? Or? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I, I just stand here. <laughs> Um, so we were thinking about how can we actually, um, what types of smell references could be there, visual smell references. And we came up with, the, with those four. Um, objects are mostly objects that either have a smell themselves or are metaphors or in another way cues, like for example drinking vessels that contain whatever is actually smelling. Um, super interesting and important for us are smell gestures, but they are also very hard to find. 
Um, fragrance spaces is another type of smell references that actually not just is localizable to one specific point in an image, but actually describes the whole scenery. And olfactory iconography is, is another type where we also want to make a relation to texts that might also talk about smells. So it's not the whole smell reference must not only be in the image, but it might also be in the textual representation of the same story, basically. Um, but here we will mostly talk about objects because this, this was also our main focus during the project. And what we did is we defined a set of smell active, smell related objects. And this is something that has continuously been debated and discussed with all the project partners. And in the end, we had these 139 smell related objects. And we trained neural networks to find them in images that they haven't seen before. So now we have this corpus of roughly 90,000 artworks, and you will be able to yeah, see what we found in them um, using the demonstrators. So demonstrators, uh, it's called Jupyter Notebooks. They are programmed in Python, but it's abstracted, so you don't have to know any coding. Um, also, something that's important is that you, don't, you cannot break it. You work on your own local copy, so just play around. Even if you want to go in the code, it's fine. We, can, we also here, we can walk around and help you if something's not working anymore. Um, I will just quickly show you how that works. And I hope that preparing the data is already ready. So what you can do, first of all, you can get an overview of what you can do by having this table of content, so you can just navigate where you want to go. And the first things you have to do is to do some preparatory st steps, which is in our case, first of all, download the data, and that, this takes some time, so I would ask you to do this once the handouts are being given to you, so you can start working with it as soon as you have finished the easier, easier uh, tasks. Uh, and you do this just by clicking on these little, on these little triangles. So this is how you run the cells. Um, you can also expand and collapse the cells, which makes things a bit easier to, to grasp the whole structure. So we have three main parts here. First is just this code and data preparation. And in the ideal case, you just click on it once, and everything should be done autonomously, but it takes some time. Then you can query the data. I'm not sure if the data preparation is yet, yet, ready yet, but um, let's see. So this is one example that we did before, right? So what you can do is you can type categories and then you can either just look in our manual annotations or you can uh, define the confidence of, of uh, the predictions. So it, this basically tells you how sure the model was that the object is actually there. And then you can just find examples of these images in our, in our database. And then clicking on the image source, you get some more context. You can also look for combinations of objects by, um, I'm not sure if the, let me just try. So you can select multiple from this um, category list and then you will get the uh, images where both are present. So let's maybe look for ashtrays and beers. That's something that seems sensible. Um, so you hold down control or with a Mac, I think it's command. And then you search for it. Ah, oh, we don't have combinations for that. Ah, because I'm, I was looking for bear, not for beer. Beerstein. So here we have some combinations. So if you see a 1.0, then this means that this, this, we are 100% sure because it's a manual annotation. But sometimes, here for example, you have predictions, and these, of course, have to be taken with a grain of salt because, yeah, it's automatic and our systems also make mistakes. We can also query by metadata, but I'm not going into details here, and we have different functions to, um, to look at uh, statistical, statistical uh, properties of our data. So, for example, what you could do is you could, if you were to be interested in flowers, for example, you could analyze the co-occurrences. How often do they appear together? How often do they appear in similar, displayed with a Venn diagram? Or you can also display the development of um, 
different uh, objects over time. And you can uh, normalize those. So you, it shows it in relation to all our annotations or in relation to the superclass. So because we have a two-level hierarchy. So for example, what you could do, you could be interested in the, uh, in the relation of tulips compared to, uh, to all fl annotated flower instances. Yeah, that's it, basically, and have fun. Matthias? So, uh, actually, now I'm just calling Stefano for the, <laughs> the text demonstrator. Uh, the, uh, but that does similar things, but on textual. Okay. After images, we have text. So what we did was the, to analyze all factor information in text was to, we have developed a, a system to extract a description of smells from the books. So what uh, we identify in text is what we call uh, olfactory event, and usually triggered by uh, a smell word, so a word like smell, stink, perfume, and so on. And for every smell event we can detect uh, in the book, we then proceed to identify and extract uh, all the relevant information for that smell. So we have uh, information like the source of the smell, the qualities used to describe the smell, the effect uh, that the smell is provoking to whatever is, whoever is present, uh, and so on. And this work is carried out in uh, seven different languages in the project. So we have English, Dutch, French, German, Italian, Slovene, and Latin. And here you can see an example of what uh, uh, smell words are for the different languages. So you have a few examples for each of the six language, seven languages. And uh, then on your uh, right, you have uh, the list of, uh, uh, I don't know, information, from what we call frame element, that we extract from, uh, uh, for each smell. So the, the source, uh, the, the carrier, like the air, or the quality, the perceiver, the evoked odorant, so something that smells like something else, the circumstances where the effect, uh, the, the smell happens, uh, when and where. Okay, the first demo is... Uh, this one? Okay, now I just sh show you briefly what we extract. Um, here you can have uh, an example of uh, what you, we actually are going to extract from texts, and you can try it on your own documents or text. What uh, you can do here is to write or copy and paste uh, any text of your choice. And here for this demo, I'm going to select uh, one of the examples. So for instance, we have a text uh, about the smell described when entering London. And, uh, after inserting your text, uh, you have to select uh, the language uh, uh, of the text. So in this case, we have English. And you can press uh, extract the smell. You can see in the top corner that it's running. So you have uh, just to wait a little bit for it to be done. And uh, OK. And when it done, it's done, you will see exactly the very same text uh, you put as input, but uh, with uh, uh, marked uh, all the relevant information. So for instance, uh, you have the old uh, Bailey Courthouse as location, in the air as uh, uh, small carrier, uh, and so on, from the burning as circumstances, uh, and so on. So you feel, can try with any text you want and see what uh, you get from it. And you can also write uh, click on download out output to save an Excel file with the sentences and the rele relevant information that were found. Now, the second uh, demo I want to show you is, again, a, not a Python notebook, so everything that Matthias said is still valid. Don't be worried to try. You can't do any damage, and you don't need to know how to code to use it. And um, now, what uh, you see before was just uh, a demo to try on a short text. What we did to, was to use that tool on a large scale. So we ran it on the entire collection and archive from the 16th to 20th century. 
And uh, at the end, we extracted uh, uh, millions of smell from more than 200,000 books. And uh, in this demo, you will be able to access the, the raw data we extracted, so we'll be in direct contact with uh, the results. Again, to use this demo, you just have to, like the previous, have to press the play to load the, the function. Then you can select, uh, why oh, is not scrolling? Okay. Then you can select uh, the language you want to use from the menu and download the data. After that, you are ready to go. And you have several uh, functions. You can see, for instance, uh, the distribution of the presence of a specific smell source over the time uh, to see in which uh, century was more or year were more, more present. Or you can even uh, see the actual text uh, we found. So, for instance, uh, you can write a uh, candle. You can select uh, a time span of your choice, uh, and you can play social show selection. And you should be able to see the text, uh, where the smell of the candle was found, uh, the, the smell source, uh, the quality, so fragrant, uh, uh, and so on or offensive in case for old candle done with uh, animal fat, uh, and so on. Another function, then, well, there are several, but I will let you play with them without going into each one. You can, for instance, see uh, the most relevant qualities uh, for a smell source uh, in different periods of, of time. So you can see how the way a uh, smell source uh, is described change over the time. So for instance, let's go again with candle. And we can say, let's see the candle in the last century. Again, against, uh, we can add a more time span against like the previous period. And if you go so show selection, you will see like that for the last century, we have a, a specific kind of language like spiritual, sweetie, uh, divine, so on. Why if you go to uh, previous period, you will see more negative uh, example like uh, poisonous, uh, uh, inferior, fetid. Uh, okay, there are some typo because uh, you will find a lot of typo because of the way uh, text uh, are uh, converted into digital text and so on. So feel free to try uh, to explore the data and see what you can find. Uh, in it. Thanks a lot, Stefano. And actually, I will just pass uh, the mic now to Ina, because uh, among uh, other things, uh, when we analyze text, sorry, oops, I went too fast, we also extract emotions in text. Um, hi, uh, so uh, today we have seen how important emotions are for smell. And uh, what we have done in Old Europa, we try to extract emotions uh, related uh, to smells from historical texts. Uh, first, we started with a model uh, which would involve only 11 emotions. It was a set of emotions plus three emotions uh, suggested by historians, such as nostalgia, love, and desire. But then, in the middle of explorations, we came to the fact that we might need some more emotions for our text. And we developed a fine-grained emotion detection model, which covers uh, 38 emotions. It's very fine-grained. You can see different emotions, such as admiration, amusement, anger, also nostalgia, uh, desire, and some emotions which are not frequently um, uh, used by uh, other researchers. Uh, the emotions are specific for the Europa data sets. And we also developed multilingual approach, which covers uh, four languages. Now we can go to um, our model. And uh, we can try to compute uh, the emotions. Uh, first, you have to load the model, and uh, um, it's loading fast. And uh, we, then we can select an example, or we can put any text which you want. Uh, into this model. And I just want to mention that uh, the models are uploaded in, uh, on a Hugging Face platform, which is a frequent platform for uh, deep learning and machine learning, learning models uh, to use. Mm 
Okay, so uh, we shall try it. Uh, everybody tries it on the computer. And uh, I can just tell you that uh, we have explored um, also the emotions which occurred in our data sets. And we have found out uh, that usually positive emotions occur together with positive and uh, negative occur together with uh, negative emotions. And uh, we have also prepared a couple of examples. It's on the link below which you can use uh, to test. And uh, I would like also to give an exa example of um, what we have found in our data sets. It's uh, the example of qualities uh, which you have seen on previous slides, which are related uh, to emotions. And on the left side, you can see qualities which are attached to nostalgia. And on the right side, you can see uh, qualities which are attached uh, to fear. And as you can see, they are quite different. Uh, and uh, also, they differ uh, over the years. Uh, so, uh, nostalgia uh, is presented more with sweet emotions and uh, fear is with stinking. Nostalgia is presented more with positive and fear with negative. And uh, uh, we can also see which sm smell sources uh, occur together with uh, nostalgia and with fear. And in this case, uh, nostalgia is very much covered with uh, flowers and uh, roses, violets, uh, blossoms. And fear is uh, uh, with blood and red and gunpowder. So those are two illustrative examples which you can find, but uh, I suggest that you go on uh, the link and try yourself. Right. So, so far you have seen a bunch of tools that uh, you see are very interactive, uh, enables you to uh, basically specify your input time period concept that you would like to search and start exploring the data. Um, but all of these um, documents, images and text, have also been pre-analyzed by the Odoropa Consortium with those tools and have fed a so-called uh, knowledge graph. And on top of this, we provide a more user-friendly interface for you to to use that enable you to search uh, and start discovering textual excerpts or image artworks that correspond to a number of filtering criteria that you will enter along the line. So think about here as the other Smell Explorer as you as you um, shopping, where you search for documents uh, that uh, mentions particular uh, smells in particular uh, circumstances. Um, so this is the URI of the. Explorer, exploratory search engine that we call the Odoropa Smell Explorer. Um, and I will show you exactly how it works. So uh, the user interface um, is normally responsive, so we'll work on mobile device. It's localized in six languages. So on the top right, you, have, um, you can change the, the interface of the language, the language of the interface, sorry. Uh, and what we have preloaded uh, is uh, more than 2.5 million um, references, olfactory references. Uh, the, the largest part, of course, is correspond to texts, but we also have this uh, large set of um, references with, with images. Now, what you can try to do with uh, this tool is to search using either textual search or conceptual search. And you will also be able to browse some um, overview pages that we have pre-assembled. Uh, so textual search is what you're most familiar with already because you're all very frequent users of, of search engine. So here on the, on the top left, uh, you see that you can have this full text uh, search um, where you can enter just search terms and search either in text but also in images using the, the captions of the images, for example, or in both and get results based on the presence of your search term in uh, the text or the, or the metadata. However, we all know that textual search uh, is a bit limited. If you search for the string P-A-I-N, or pain, or pain in French, um, well, you will get uh, results that mixed sort of, except where people feel pain on something, but also mention the famous bakery, French bakery. Um, so classic homonymy uh, problem. That, that we all know very well. Um, textual search is great, but it's, it's not multilingual. Um, it has uh, a lot of false positive problems. 
That's why uh, to um, circumvent those limitations, um, we, we want to avoid these false friends across languages. Um, we want to, uh, uh, to, uh, to be sure to also encompass synonyms or translations and so on and so on. And of course, uh, address images uh, that, that uh, we want to search beyond the, the simple caption of the image. So for that, uh, uh, in Odoropa, we have developed so-called control vocabularies. Um, those are pre-existing vocabularies that uh, we have um, collected, or new vocabularies that we have created that can correspond to olfactory objects, typically the ones that we want to detect in images and who are of interest in text, olfactory gestures that we have already talked about, fragrant spaces, so specific notion of space, like uh, a bedroom, uh, a coffee house, and so on, that really convey specific smell information. And also, of course, all sort of scent wheels and uh, olfactory descriptors to describe the quality, the intensity, uh, the hedonic tone of the smells. So all those vocabularies are multilingual, which means that when you start searching with a particular concept from those vocabularies, you search across all languages, even if filtering by language is, of course, possible. So that brings us the idea of conceptual search, where basically here, instead of doing the full text search, you can select specific concepts in the, in the different fil filters that you will see appearing in the tool, um, and then uh, get documents that are relevant uh, with this concept. Um, so what are the search filters you can have? Well, you can search according to the smell source, um, which typically will be tobacco, rose, frankincense, etc., or the carrier of the smell, that could be hair, smoke, etc. The quality of the smell, so how we, or, or the, the smell have been um, uh, described in the text, um, such as um, strong, pungent, and so on, so that includes also the intensity. The emotion that we have just talked about, the language, um, that is only specific for text. Uh, time and space uh, um, uh, filters. Uh, and also, later on, if you really want to dig only into a single source that we have loaded, rather than the, the multitude of sources we have um, uh, preloaded, you can also specify this. Um, when you search for uh, particular excerpts, this is the detailed page of, of, uh, of an excerpt here, where you can see uh, the title, uh, where this text come from, uh, which books, uh, which author, etc. Uh, the link to the original source, you can always go back to the original source uh, to check. Um, the extracted data that all tools have automatically extracted, so in this case, for example, the, the value of the emotion we have detected, uh, and so on. Uh, and the text excerpt itself with some uh, words that would be color coded uh, or underlined. Uh, and similarly, for images, you will have a similar view page with the title of the image and some metadata, the link to the original source, and the extracted data with uh, also the bounding boxes around the objects or the gesture that have been recognized with the confidence score because you understood that it's not um, a sure process, so to speak, so there is always a level of confidence. We also have assembled what we call overview pages, um, so, for example, if you would like to get um, all possible smell sources, which are uh, also part of a taxonomy, uh, for example, here I'm searching for food, and within food, I have all sort of different type of smell sources, uh, and we have a count of the number of textual excerpts or images that you are likely to find, and we have built such overview pages for smell sources, for gestures, and for fragrant places. Um, when you go to a particular smell source, you have this sort of overview. Uh, for example, here we're looking at the smell of cigar, and you see three distinct word clouds. The first one is about the smell quality, generally associated with cigar. The second one is the emotion, generally associated with the smell source. And the third one is the fragrant space that we often find related to this smell source. So unsurprisingly for cigar, we found that uh, close to pipes, rooms, um, and so on. Uh, and then under, you will start seeing all cards that you can switch uh, to uh, the card view or the textual view, in the case of a textual excerpt, or to the image view, 
um, in, in, when those are images, uh, with all the things that have been described. Uh, you will see on those cards a little hurt. Uh, that means that you can like or save or favorite those cards that you found. Why? Because those cards then get automatically added into your shopping basket, your wish list. And this list you can control, you can give it a name, and you can even share it with your colleagues. You can um, collaboratively edit lists all together uh, of the best things you found that you would like then to reuse, maybe to tell stories about what you found. Which brings me to the very last part on how one can tell stories with what we found. And here I'm calling Will. Yeah, thank you, Raphael. Very nice link uh, there. Um, so, hey everybody. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm William Tullett. I'm the leader of the work package on Odoropa that's been responsible really for taking all this wonderful data and then creating histories from it. So narratives, stories, interpretations and contextualizations that kind of make meaning uh, from all of this material. And one of the key ways in which that's been expressed has been in the form of our Encyclopedia of Smell, History and Heritage, which is a growing resource um, which will grow and grow over the next few months as we add more and more entries to it and storylines. Um, it's composed of two principal things. It's composed of uh, entries, um, and these are clustered uh, under smells, noses, places, and objects. Um, so, uh, which you can then kind of, they're more kind of standard kind of encyclopedia type entries, uh, and I'll show you some examples in a moment. Um, and then also uh, storylines, which are really a way of kind of following your nose through the past. Uh, so, oh, is it this? Ah, okay. Um, so, uh, entries. Uh, so, the entries can be browsed uh, in a number of ways. Uh, they can just be browsed as a list, uh, but you can also uh, search through them either by uh, text search uh, or by tags. So, all of the entries have big lists of tags attached to them. So, for example, um, there, there is still um, a Rosemary Street in Amsterdam, right? So say that we wanted to understand the history of Rosemary Street. Why is there a street in Amsterdam called Rosemary Street? We might start by looking uh, at the tag Rosemary. If we search for the tag Rosemary, we get five different entries uh, in the encyclopedia um, that refer to Rosemary that we could look at. So we might go to the obvious place, which is the entry on Rosemary itself, which you can here uh, see the top of here. Um, and that includes uh, a kind of sections on smells, places, practices, and feelings and noses. Um, all connected to the smell of rosemary over time. And you can also see there on the slide the green bar. So this is a way that you can access the Smell Explorer data via the encyclopedia website uh, itself. Uh, and then the other part of this is the storylines. And the storylines are, as I said already, a kind of way of exploring uh, a nose-first approach to the past um, that was built using Twine, which is an open-source digital storytelling tool that allows you to kind of do choose-your-own-adventures. Um, and so one of those stories um, takes up uh, the idea of Rosemary Street uh, in Amsterdam and attempts to take you through, essentially, why a street was named after the smell of rosemary and, and what that could mean. Um, and the idea with the Twine storylines uh, on the encyclopedia is partly that they branch off in multitudes of different directions. And so what they allow you to do is kind of skip using smell through different places and times in the past and really make use of smell's power to kind of evoke multiple different times and places uh, at once. Uh, so you can kind of use smell as the kind of connective tissue that takes you through the past. Uh, so that's everything from me, and I presume I hand back over to Raphael again. Great, so this is the single slide with all pointers, but don't worry because this uh, will be on uh, your printout as well. So we are distributing, distributing you now printouts. Uh, because of the funny things of the printer, you have to read bottom to top. I know this is unconventional, uh, but the, the, the very first slide is at the bottom, and then top, and then uh, next page, bottom, top, bottom, top. Right? Um, so 
I, I just let uh, you open, uh, take your device at hand, get familiar with the material. And what I would like to propose you is to very, very slowly start um, following up those exercises we have prepared so you get familiar with our tools. And uh, I mean, think slide is nice, but experimenting with them is even better. So for that, what we have envisioned is uh, to create a persona, and we would like that you all imagine that you are this person that we propose you to impersonate. So this morning, our person will be Jean Chabert, an independent perfumer who speaks English, French, French, and Italian. So uh, contrary to the picture here, is a 21st century perfumer um, with a bit old fashioned hairstyle, and he wants to create a new perfume with a coffee like aroma. Okay? Um, so he became interested in um, historical coffee scents, what has been the century long attraction of the smell of coffee, what different scent sensations can coffee have, and to explore this, um, our perfumer is organizing a workshop with a coffee sommelier about the history of coffee in Europe between the 17th and the 18th century. And in the end, he wants to create an aromatic perfume and present this in a bottle shape like a coffee pot. So this is his task. This is your task now because you are all Jean Chabert this morning. So just before we start, um, it would be good that either mentally or with a pen and uh, putting that on paper, you just write down what kind of qualification or descriptors you would give to the smell of coffee, assuming you're all familiar with the smell of coffee. If you can think about what other odorants you would like to connect to the smell of coffee, what elements would go into your perfume recipe, and if you have to envision a coffee pot that could be a nice model for your perfume bottle, so can you have this mental picture? Because of course, I, afterwards, we will try to search for such an ideal pictures in our collection. I'll let you just 30 seconds, one minute to write down your thoughts. Right, so now I invite you to go to explore.odoropa.eu, so the home page of our um, Odoropa Smell Explorer tool. Um, so this is the landing page, and you see the, the menu on the top left where you can start browsing directly or um, having access to those overview pages I just talked about, about the smell sources, the fragrance space, the gestures and allegories. And on the right side, you have the ability to switch the user interface, the language of the user interface to any of the other language that uh, is your favorite language. And you can decide to uh, log in. In this case, uh, it is already connected and log in to a particular user profile. So the step one that we propose you to do, so if you uh, yeah, either use your phone, tablet, or, or, or laptop, is to browse the Odor Smell Explorer for coffee as a smell source. Um, so like I told you, we can either use the full text search and search for coffee, or rather go for um, those um, smell source that are uh, concept. So if I'm searching for coffee, and I know, of course, how to type coffee, um, I then can just click on the smell of coffee and see the rise of popularity, 
of the coffee around the time. You see, I can just also select a subset of time. And, and what were the qualities that were um, given um, to the smell of coffee? And this is interesting to see if those qualities match what you had mentally written just before. Um, you can, of course, uh, look now at the, at the various um, cards and, and see the textual excerpt um, that we found related to that. But you see that uh, without selecting the, the particular time period, I had nearly 5,000 results. It's probably way too much. Um, so we would like to only limit that to a particular languages. So I'm, I'm going um, now to the browse page and select coffee as my smell source. I got all my results that I can see as cards or as text. Uh, and you can click on every of those cards to, uh, to see uh, uh, more. But I can also specify the language. So I said here I'm only interested into the French one. And I have less results. Can you all do this, sort of? You interrupt me when you're lost, huh? So, uh, let me just switch to the text part, and um, I think this one was nice. Instructions sur la recherche des poissons. Oh, des poissons, sorry. Dear. Exactly. But I like it, so I would like to save it. You see this little hurt here, so I save it. And because now I want to save it, save it I can save it to an existing list already or just create a, um, a new list for today, the smell fair. Um, and you see that this item has been added to the smell fair list. Uh, so later on I can share my list with my colleagues. Um, I can navigate through the many, many results via those arrows back and, and forward, or just go back to the search results and keep um, exploring uh, and see the many, 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 many pages that we have. Uh, let me just, oh, the language was probably too. Oh, no coffee smell is worse. Because we only depend on the coffee. Oh, yeah, yeah, you have the coffee pot. Sorry, it, it's on my mistake. So, uh, okay, for being able to save, you have to log in, of course, and you can log in using uh, either uh, Google, Facebook, or Twitter. Uh, so, let me just go back to my coffee French. Results and start reading as text. Um, if, if you would a bit, uh, spend a bit of time reading those texts, and here I display text in French, uh, you will realize that um, the, the smell of coffee is often um, associated to um, uh, bitter as the, as the quality. Um, and what is interesting is that uh, Jean or perfumer can be very curious in um, uh, trying to guess what other smells could be also called bitter. Um, so how you would do that if you would uh, combine coffee and bitter? Uh, you could of course st start typing here bitter in the full text search box, right? Uh, but if I do that, uh, bitter is an English word, and here I'm displaying French text, I'm unlikely to find the strings bitter in French text, or it will not mean what I meant. Um, so uh, how I can do that? Uh, you will search instead for the quality, uh, bitter, which here is the concept of bitter, and not only 
the, um, the string, uh, and, and it becomes still multilingual. So here I have uh, French results associated with coffee and bitter, and this is exactly what I wanted. So I will start saving a bit more of those nice codes for later. Um, if you're wondering, we are now at step six in our nice enzyme. Um, so taking interest in what the sensation of coffee drinking must have been in the early days, uh, uh, John also would like to uh, basically start having more information about uh, coffee houses. And for this, we can thank Will and others who have edited a nice encyclopedia entry about coffee houses. So we can go to the encyclopedia. And start searching for uh, coffee houses. No, oh, photo was it to complete? It's not. Ah. Oh yeah, sorry. And uh, discover the nice uh, encyclopedia entry about coffee house. Um, Oh, I should credit James Brown for having actually created this entry. Um, and oh, is it too small? Maybe I don't. I can't really realize if it's too small or okay. Uh, but so uh, you will see that as for every encyclopedia entry, they all follow a similar template where uh, basically we get information about the smell, about places, about practices. Um, and, and, and later on about feelings and noses associated to, uh, uh, to this particular uh, smell source in this case, or oh, smell place. Um, this is after reading this encyclopedia entry that uh, Jean come back to uh, the Smell Explorer and really would lack uh, inspiration for his... Um, um, coffee pot design, because this is what you would like to use where the perfume will be uh, stored. Um, so, again, you can clear everything and start searching for, um, uh, so it would be a carrier, a coffee pot. And get images, a lot of historical images, where coffee pots have been rec uh, recognized, right? Uh, uh, so, as always, you can always go back to a specific image. So here you have a coffee pot. Now, visually, I don't know how much you're an expert in coffee pots, but visually, it's very hard to distinguish coffee pots from teapots. So, um, because he, he realized this is, this is very hard, so it's very hard for the human, but it's very hard for the machine as well. Uh, we can also select multiple and say, I'm also interested into teapot and not only coffee pots. And we have even more results, of course, um, of artworks that depicts either teapots or coffee pots according to the machine, of course. So perhaps uh, Jean found a great inspiration in some images that he found that could be the next uh, things he will use. And if you reach, oh no, we have one more stage. Uh, now we are on step eight. Um, so thinking about this uh, cozy, enticing atmospheres in the old coffee houses, uh, Jean, as you know, has read so much of those texts and see so much of those images that he's wondering whether we could not make perfume but we combine the smell of coffee with um, that of the tobacco smoke. I'm not sure it's a very good idea, but this is what Jean thinks. And of course, Jean is not a smoker himself. He can always talk to his friends who are 
vapor uh, friendly. Um, so all this exercise was to force you to again clear your search and maybe go this time to gestures and allegories. And uh, simply uh, look at smoking as a gesture to have more uh, uh, textual references and visual artworks where um, we can clearly see this gesture uh, being recognized um, and, and perhaps get inspiration through those um, artworks or textual excerpts in, in what he wants to convey. And if you reach that stage, um, I hope to have not been too fast, we should just congratulate you. I've gone through the first milestone of using the exploratory search engine enable you to search and discover uh, textual excerpts or images uh, according to filtering criteria that you can just input via the user interface. But now you have seen that we have way more tools than just Explorer, uh, all the notebooks we have given to you before. So now we are giving you full autonomy to either keep exploring using uh, the exploratory search engine and j just search for other stuff, or perform one of the free advanced tasks that we uh, give you in the next slides. Um, the first one consists in, in putting, oh yeah, I hope that everybody has loaded the models, but I don't see many laptops here, so. I will repeat, sorry. Uh, I'll repeat because you don't have a mic. Ma Matthias, you don't have a mic, so I repeat. Ah. <laughs> so the, the recommendation is for, for performing the advanced task, because you will go into the notebook environments, for the ones who have a laptop that will not work on your phone, um, you uh, need to quickly launch the notebooks and load the models because that takes time, uh, up to five or, or even 10 minutes. So if you are, uh, want to be prepared, you can keep exploring and doing things, but uh, uh, load the models, otherwise you would be frustrated of not being able to have access to those nice results. So the, those advanced tasks, we are here to support you, by the way. So we are a number of colleagues here that can go behind your shoulders and guide you to perform one of those three advanced tasks. The first one, we basically suggest you to input any text you want in um, the Odoropa um, smell extractors and see how much we can extract uh, smell-related information from the text you provide. The second advanced task consists in going to the notebook um, that Stefano has shown you, where you can analyze more generally the entire corpora, in this case, see uh, what coffee smells, um, uh, what, what we know about coffee smells over the entire Odoropa corpora, uh, and perhaps you will be able to generate those nice work clouds that we have put into the pictures. And the third advanced task would be this time using images, uh, the notebook about images, and perhaps find all images that depict both tobacco and smell at the same time. So this is what we have for you now. Uh, we're happy to help you if you want to keep exploring or ask any questions. Feedback? Yep. Smell sources, yes. Uh, it's a very good question. So um, our, our approach has been the following. Um, this, is, this is a bit hidden here in this menu. What we call graph is actually a different source. So you will recognize a library, uh, like the British Library, like uh, uh, Gallica, which is the French uh, Library, Europeana, and so on and so on. So different uh, large corpora that for which we have started to input, indeed, um, uh, smell word to find what are the passages that are likely to contain a reference to a smell. And then we have been pretty large in finding you know, an encompassing passage of 
a few lines before, a few lines after in order to have enough context. And those are the textual excerpts that we have loaded and then later on um, analyzed with all our machinery. I guess the question is what you mean by that. Right, so the seed words were multiple and in multiple languages. Um, uh, so we have a long list. I'm not sure, even sure to enumerate all, but it, you can think about, um, of course, uh, smell, uh, stinky. Uh, so there are both adjectives and, uh, and nouns that um, uh, belong to the olfactory terminology. And verbs. And verbs as well, correct. And that is multilingual as well. So this is what we used. We try to fish large and then uh, analyze. Us. Domain experts, indeed, uh, but our collective intelligence. <laughs> yes. Very good question. Yes, we have uh, the ambition and actually the duty to preserve that and maintain that to the maximum extent we can. So concretely, what will happen? The project is still ongoing until the end of the year, so for a bit more than a month now. Um, at the end, we will snapshot everything we have, so the database, and, and publish the snapshots on a, on a permanent resource like Zenodo. So that is for for making sure that this resource will always be available. But on the other, the other hand, this tool will also be maintained for at least the next three or five years. Um, so you will always be able to use it and browse it. And we're also considering how we could um, have a process for you to also input new corpora um, that, that becomes available for everybody. So this is also a process we are trying to work on the details on how we will facilitate that. Yes. Yes. ECH, ECCCH. <laughs> yes. Yeah, f thanks for the nice suggestions. Those are all on our list indeed of, of uh, communities we are uh, already either connected or, or, or plan to connect. So uh, we will look forward to the winner of the big ECCCH grant uh, awardee. So we don't know yet who is this consortium, but when we will know for sure we will get close to them. Yeah. I was just curious about the general coffee idea, because <laughs> coffee is something that's very diverse. Uh, you mentioned bitter and coffee from Colombia is anything but bitter. Right. So is it possible to also uh, search geography? By geography, yes. Uh, geography is also a filter, indeed. Uh, this is what we call place here, uh, where you will have countries uh, mentioned. Uh, however, I have to say that um, uh, recognizing geography in text is very hard because um, it's not often that text explicitly mention uh, country names or city names. So when they do, we of course try to extract this information, but often they don't. And we have sort of to uh, extrapolate this information, maybe based on where the offer comes from and so on. Uh, but even this is, you know, is, is not completely sure. So there is a lot of information which, are, which is not geolocalized in, in, in that sense. So while you can apply this filter, that will immediately narrow down a lot your space on only the subset that explicitly mentioned geography, which is not that common. These are not about places, as it's about networks of moving olfactory objects and experiences. Um, 
it's really hard. So uh, maybe this idea of place or uh, a, a station relocation uh, is one, but not the only way to think geographically about sense. So I, you need to create a different concept of a network. Uh, yeah, no, we, we fully agree. And, and to tell you the truth, originally in the very earlier version of the exploratory tools, we had the map. Uh, and we realized that that was not really making sense because you will pin everything you know, in, in a country without any distinction. So the map view was not that much helpful. And that's why here we have two notions of place actually in the exploratory search engine. We have the notion of geography as we know it, so countries, um, continents, uh, cities, when it's being mentioned. But I think what is more useful is also this notion of fragrant space. Uh, where here you will find, uh, you know, different type of things, um, beach, bathroom, building, factory, and so on, which make much more, more sense than, than geography. So a different notion of space. Also, of course, you make it very clear that it's a European, a Eurocentric, as it were, project, you know, so that other parts of the world might have different Absolutely. Uh, ideas of your diversity. Yeah. Yeah, this is true. Yes. To what extent are these images or words linked to actual chemicals that you would find in those spaces or associated with those words? Is there any chemical information in there? Uh, again, a very good question. We, we were we're still hoping to bring that into this Mel Explorer. Uh, so it's, it's a work in progress. Uh, so more concretely, um, uh, what we are working on with our controlled vocabularies is we have uh, a large set of odor descriptors that are explicitly linked to chemicals uh, based on expert panel that you know have uh, associated specific chemicals with odor descriptors, um, and uh, perhaps in the in the short term future in the smell explorers we will be able to go through. Uh, sense quality or the descriptors and, and chemicals that are associated with those uh, descriptors. So this is something we plan to add. This is on our wish list. Um, as, a perfume, as a perfumer myself, I think it's very important to uh, geolocate the, the smells because for us it's really important the denomination of origin that we uh, have to give to many of the ingredients we use in the industry. So it's important to make uh, a difference between the, the sandalwood from Mysore, the actual sandalwood from India, or the sandalwood that we got from Caledonia, which is the sandalwood wood we start having after the regulations in India, or the tuberose, you know, that it comes from Mexico, or the tonka bean that right now comes from Brazil, because we don't have it anymore from Venezuela because of the political issues they have in there. So um, I think it's important to have clear minds about where the things come from, as well because right now we work from a sustainable and social conscious. So we have to look after those uh, communities that actually provide us the raw materials. So when you, I've been listening to you in here about this, um, you know. Um, thing of, of, of uh, locating geographically the smells. And um, so, I'm, 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 so as a perfumer, I think it's important to, to have this clear mind about, about it. And especially because, um, you know, I'm, I'm of Colombian origin, I'm half Colombian, half Spaniard. And uh, as a Colombian, I think it's very unfair that um, a lot of the uh, ingredients that comes from, the, from Latin America are placed in the industry as orientals. So, Andanila has nothing to do with Middle East because it's Mexican. Tonka bean has nothing to do with Middle East because it's, it's, it comes from Colombia, Venezuela, and Brazil. If we talk about Peru balm or Copal balm, you know, those come from Colombia and Mexico. They're not oriental. So, why not building up a, a, a specific category that comes as tropical, for example? <laughs> you know? So, yeah. The, the, the issue is something that we need to work on yeah. in this industry still, because we need to decolonize somehow this. And I'm talking about the perspective being European from my mom's side and Colombian from my dad's side. Yeah. And I have 
European educational background, and I lived in Colombia when I was a kid. So um, that's something really interesting, you know, because I have fit in here and another. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for bringing this issue. So indeed, uh, the, the very first part of what you were saying brings me to this idea of the of the smell source that could be even more fine grained We try to have already a taxonomy of possible smell sources, but like all you said, the coffee, uh, if this is a concept, can be very different depending where its geographical origin, for example, and so on. So um, so indeed, we could do we could always go more finer grain when we have to describe or or, or concepts. Uh, that, I guess, is probably room for improvements of, over what we have done so far. Um, now, um, uh, we could discuss probably forever about um, taxonomies and how we, uh, uh, we classify things. And, and I, I have a lot of sympathy with what you said on, on, on this idea of decolonizing a way of, of um, classifying things. Um, uh, but that, for me, it's, a, it's more a call for the community to have more experts' eyes on those taxonomies and what sort of improvements we can, we can always do. So here again, in Odoropa, we have been a pretty transparent and open process where the taxonomies are available via GitHub, so uh, particular systems, but anyone can keep uh, raising issues and, uh, and, and, and proposing improvements on how you will classify things differently. For example, in your concrete cases, you mentioned because you would like that this particular source is not tagged as oriental, but differently. Uh, and I think that is important that uh, the community at large uh, improve those, uh, those classifications. Okay. Yeah. You can add that the uh, representation that's available could accommodate that. Yeah. Right? Maybe repeat. Yeah, so Daniel was just pointing out that the underlying model enabled to accommodate those multiple point of view and representations anyway. So the model is, is open and flexible enough to not impose a single viewpoint on how things should be classified because things sometimes are contentious or can be further discussed. Yeah, sure. It's very straightforward. Yeah. It's like there's not much no, I was not arguing your example is contentious. <laughs> but in general. Yeah, it's like we have certain ingredients that we know where they come from and where they are produced and who is, you know, who hired that to to prepare this whole thing, you know, for us to work. Yeah. So this session has still five more minutes to run. Uh, you will receive an email, just a quick poll. Did you all receive my email yesterday about this session? Okay, I'm seeing nodding head, so it's good. So that means email's gone through. Um, so you will all receive um, uh, later today a, a link to a Google form because we would like to capture your feedback on this session, okay? What, what you have been able to do, use, how likely you are uh, to, to use those tools in the future and so on. So of course you can keep exploring things and we are here all today to help you further. Uh, but uh, do not forget to fill up this form because that will help us tremendously to improve um, the tool and the way we present them. Who have uh, been brave enough to go to some advanced task? Some are trying? Yeah, some. Oh, cool. Wow, <laughs> this is very brave. <laughs> um, yeah, so otherwise we are happy to close this session. Thanks for your participation anyway.